But after she left, he said, I hope so. I've been speaking English since I was. <laughs> Let's move on to the most important thing, how race affects our children. So I get home from work one night, my daughter Sophia, the littler one's in preschool, and I'm tired, I want to get out of my suit, and I want to get in my comfy jammies, and I want to eat dinner, and she comes in and she says, Mom, I went to school today, and Lucy called me brown. I said, honey, you're not brown, you're half and half. <laughs> <laughs> I won't win any mom awards for that. <laughs> Contestant number two, Carlton Jones, my mistress, my mistress, Carlton Jones. <laughs> challenges, just like my last job interview. <laughs> <laughs> Backdrop. A few years ago, met a few friends who worked at a company. They said this was the greatest company in the world. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I'll give it a go. They talked about an opportunity, filled out a job application. Lo and behold, I got a call from an HR director. Not saying, though. <laughs> this HR director Great, effervescent personality, charming, extremely professional. We, we hit it off right off the bat. 
she would have hired me right away, but she said there was a panel interview process I had to go through, which consisted of giving out a fictitious report. Let's talk about this panel interview thing. Has anyone ever eaten with a chef? <laughs> Played baseball or watched baseball or any sport with an umpire? <laughs> or watched a movie with a director? Annoying, with a capital A, <laughs> annoying. <laughs> and that's how these people were at this interview, annoying with the capital A. Because of that, that interview didn't quite go so well. And it would have tied in perfectly into what Sam presented earlier <laughs> today. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't also include a few minor details to go with that, such as, I, I forgot to practice the actual report. <laughs> Which resulted in a little bit of a train wreck. A little bit more backdrop. I had four days, four days to get ready for this. So you know what I did. I blew off the first three. <laughs> <laughs> blew it off. I'm Carlton Jones. <laughs> Famous last words. Maybe not the best thing to do. Day four comes up. Six o'clock. I've got everything set up. Laptop, rock star, notes. I'm going to knock this report out. And I get a call from an internationally known, locally accepted artist. Well, a slight embellishment on my resume there. <laughs> More like she, she's my friend and she sings okay. <laughs> <laughs> she, had a, she had a gig at Beat Kitchen, Belmont and Damon, if you guys know the Lakeview area. I'll go check Stoli out, my friend Stoli, the <laughs> artist. I'll check her out, be done, get on a report at 8 and in 10. <laughs> well, that's the party. <laughs> 12, <laughs> two, 5. <laughs> I've got this though, I've got this. <sighs> Bill Carlton Jones. <laughs> 5, 30, no problem. Now the report wasn't bad. Analytics were good, financials were great, content stellar. But as I said, I didn't practice this thing at all. A grammarian's nightmare. Um, well, you see, uh, the, the, that matches up. Um, yeah, and, and there's the red ink coming out. Going to town. And at that point, all I can hear is Charlie Brown whenever they're asking me a question. Why, 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 why? <laughs> HR director calls the next day, and it's pretty much me picking up the phone. Thank you very much. Don't forget to tip your waiters and waitresses. I'm a total loser. I'm sorry for wasting your time. And she said, you didn't waste my time. The panel interview, we had a few concerns, but we still want you to come in and meet with the regional VP. Now, check me out. Yes. <laughs> I'm six foot. 230 pounds, I'm an alpha male. I'm Carlton Jones. <laughs> the regional VP is 6'6", six, six, uh, 270, yeah. double alpha male. Uh, <laughs> but I'm Carlton Jones. <laughs> no problem. We get in here, sit down because I'm, I'm Carlton Jones. I'm going to relax. I'm in the arena. What is this Xbox symbol? This is supposed to be... Well, re relax, okay. focus, 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 relaxation techniques. I'm, I'm Carlton Jones, baseball bat, good to go. Golf club in the corner, good to go. Travel baseball uniform, good to go. He, he, he's a sports guy. I'm a sports administrator, there's blood in the water. I'm Carlton Jones, I've got this. For the next four hours, four hours, we talked about a fastball versus a changeup, college versus high school, pop time versus pop time versus 60 time. But most importantly, and there better not be a Cub fan here, uh, in order to be a White Sox fan. Now, lost total track of time, it's five o'clock, I said, Matt, at this point, 
man, I gotta get out of here. I, I gotta pick up my son. He said, look kid, panel review, it sucked. You were horrible. You horrible presentation skills, but I like you. Why should I hire you? No problem. You can teach me how to present. I'll make you money. You'll retain people. Can't teach a TED out of school that, can you? you? Got up, shook my hand, you're hired. We thanked our director for the details. And I floated out. It's all Carlton Jones! <laughs> HR director said, that is the longest interview I've ever seen in my life. And I said to myself, that thing was only one minute. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know, though, that by doing that interview and meeting that VP, I met the mistress of my life, Table Topics. <laughs> <laughs> Contestant number three, Logan Turner. The show must go on. The show must go on. Logan Turner.
So our two actors, Hamlet and Laertes, start going at it, and they've got their swords, and they start fighting, and everything's going well. And then all of a sudden, they pull them out again, and they go in for their parry, and they touch swords, and whoosh, the sword shatters huh. onto oh. the stage. To be or not to be intact. <laughs> That's how it goes, right? Well, in our case, we were lucky in that we used two sets of swords for this fight. So Laertes, the actor who is playing, or the actor who's playing Laertes, decides, well, I can't do anything with this weird, like, hilt of a sword in my hand. So she drops it, rushes upstage, grabs the broadsword, and they move forward. Which all would have been fine. Except for the fact that we have pretty much the entire cast on stage, and we've now moved several pages forward in the script, and nobody knows where we are. And we can't exactly, is there a performance? We can't just go, line? Stage management? Anyone? <laughs> no. So you can practically hear the wheels turning as we all try to figure out, where, where are we going? <laughs> What's next? Eventually someone shouted a line, and I think we all just kind of went with it, and it turned out fine. So that's the prop fail. The last one is the missed cue. And this is one where it could be a lighting cue, it could be a sound cue. In my case, it was a person not coming on stage cue. <laughs> Same performance of Hamlet, believe it or not. I think we were cursed from the beginning. We were skipping intermission that night because we were doing a performance for a bunch of high school students. And we were trying to be mindful of their time, so everyone's backstage, remember, no, we're not taking intermission. You can see where this is going. So after intermission, lights come up, I step out on the stage, and the two actors who play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are supposed to be backstage waiting to come on shortly for our scene. And I can see backstage that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern aren't back there. <laughs> Okie dokie. Well, so I have a few lines of soliloquy, which is where you're just kind of talking to yourself. And I decide, I know they can hear me in the green room, so I'm just going to talk really slowly and hope that they hear me, realize their error, and come find me on stage. So I'm doing my lines, pokely like And I glance back over, still no sign of them. Rosenbrand and Guildenstern are not coming. <laughs> <laughs> and as Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage with no one else on it. <laughs> <laughs> well. I decide to do the only thing I can do, which is to continue with my lines and just pretend like I'm still talking to myself and hope that no one notices. Just changing up some pronouns. I just won't say their name. So I'm trying to, you know, I can't really improv Shakespeare. I know some people can. I am not one of those So I sputter through my lines. Eventually, my next scene partner comes on and we continue on. So that's the missed cue. The prop drop, the prop fail, the missed cue, I love these stories because they happen all the time in live theater, and they may seem really panic-inducing at the time, but the end result was fine. The show went on. It was no big deal. As Shakespeare says, the course of true love and performances never did run smooth. After all, the show must go on. Thank you. <laughs>
Tonight, I want to tell you about my favorite emergency. Yes, that's right, I have a favorite emergency. Let me start by saying that I'm divorced, and that is not it. <laughs> when I got divorced, I vowed I would never get married again. Been there, done that, had the t-shirt and the two beautiful kids to prove it. I was good. Then, I met Matt. You see, he was never getting married again either. We were a perfect pair. Needless to say, our relationship took everyone by surprise. Including us, our friends, my ex-husband, and eventually my children. Now, my oldest daughter, Ella, seemed to catch wind of it before I ever said a thing. Because one night, in the middle of dinner, she breaks out into full-on Broadway-style musical theater song and dance. You're never getting married! You're not getting married! I won't ever let you get married! <laughs> that I loved Matt, and that if he was going to be in my life, he had to meet the girls. Well, that, and they seem to develop this kind of radar, or should I say Matt-dar, <laughs> so that every time they were safely and sweetly tucked in bed and sound asleep and he would come over to see me, suddenly someone had to get up for a drink of water, <laughs> or they were hungry, or they could sense. Mom was having fun in the room, <laughs> <laughs> and they were not invited. <laughs> so needless to say, instead of leaving them wondering who was this strange man on the couch with mommy, we decided that they should meet, and we decided we should take them out to dinner. So one Sunday, the girls get home from their visit with their dad, they come in the door, and Ella makes a beeline for the stairs, stomps off everyone, flings her door open into her room, into her closet. Oh. I'm not going. I say, Ella, please come on. He seems like a really nice guy. I know this about him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's not like we're going to get married or anything. <laughs> Even her dad tries to convince her, it's all right, Ella, come on. So somehow, we all cajole her into the car, we get her in. I'm driving to this fine establishment of Panera Bread. <laughs> and I hear Ella from the back seat. I'm telling Grams. Now, Grams is my mother, and she was coming to visit next week. And I say, well, that's OK, sweetheart. You can tell Grams anything. <laughs> that's not the answer she was looking so she continues, you two go on a date, and it involves a plane. I am writing a fake note that says the plane has been canceled. <laughs> <laughs> and you will do whatever the fake note tells you. <laughs> so now I'm looking over at Matt. He's got his lips pursed. He's really trying not to laugh. Now I'm really trying not to laugh. And Ella continues. And if your date involves a car, I am writing a fake note that says the car has been stolen and do not look in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> and you will do whatever the fake note tells you. So now at this point, my youngest daughter is pleading with Ella. Come on, it's OK. Just give the guy a chance. It's not a big deal. But Ella continues. And if I see the two of you kiss, I am yelling, emergency! <laughs> Thank God at this point we pull up to the restaurant and we can get out of the car without making eye contact and laughing. We get into the restaurant water our food. Ella refuses to sit next to Matt. 
So Isabel, being the good sport, of course, does. And thank goodness for Isabel, she starts making conversation. And she's talking about the wild animal's birthday party that she just attended, and how she got to see a baby lynx cat. Well, at this point, Matt, so ever slyly, pulls his phone out of his pocket and starts Googling images of wild animals. Well, now Ella's interest is piqued, but she's trying not to show him. Her eyebrows are raising. She's looking around. She comes around the table, sidles in between Matt and Isabel, and suddenly it's... Can we see images of baby pandas? How about baby giraffes? What about sea turtles? <laughs> and just like that, Matt is in. <laughs> now, I'm not saying we never had an emergency. In fact, Ella taught it to all her friends. So if you can imagine, your partner comes home from a long day at work, and you give him a kiss hello, and a whole gaggle of girls start screaming, EMERGENCY! <laughs> and giggling and running out of the room. <laughs> but that was just it. It became a joke. About a year after Matt met the girls, we all officially became a family, despite our best intentions to never do so again. And there is this beautiful photo of Ella wiping happy tears from her eyes. And when we kissed as husband and wife, she forgot to yell, EMERGENCY! <laughs> Thank you. A minute of silence as the judges mark their ballot. Contestant number five, Dan Stanton. Permanent reminder of a temporary feeling. Permanent reminder of a temporary feeling, Dan Stanton. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Toastmasters and guests, I have a tattoo. Now my father would tell you, Daniel, <laughs> tattoos are a permanent reminder of a temporary feeling. <laughs> and I couldn't agree with him more. Except for this one tattoo I have. Uh -oh. Don't worry, it's PG-15. <laughs> okay. So I have a tattoo that is recognizable across the United States. And it is of the Fighting Irishman of the University of Notre Dame. <laughs> now there are three people that deserve to have this tattoo. <laughs> One, you went to the University of Notre Dame. <laughs> Two, you went to a high school named Notre Dame. <laughs> Three, you might have played college football, maybe had a fake girlfriend, got caught in a scandal oh. in the NCAA. Oh. <laughs> maybe. Ladies and gentlemen, I have none of these. <laughs> no, I went to Vegas. Uh. 
and it did not stay there. So let me tell you how I got my Vegas tattoo. Now, I was a wrestler in college, and we would go to Vegas to compete against some of the biggest schools in the country. And while we were there, we had to practice. We would arrive on Thursday and wrestle on Monday. There was no drinking, no gambling, no walking the strip, no girls, no stripping girls. <laughs> no. And then we would practice. And on Monday, we competed. Blood, sweat, tears. We wrestled. And then we raged. <laughs> <laughs> if you look it up in Miriam's dictionary, honest to rage is the act of locking 20 adult males in a Vegas hotel room <laughs> and then telling them they can go do whatever they want. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> so we went out. We went into Caesars, got tossed, got booted out of Bellagio. Paris wouldn't even let us in, and she lets everyone in. <laughs> <laughs> we found ourselves back in the hotel room with nothing to do, and a case of beer, and I'm still not tattooed. So, my buddy Larry, yeah, this guy who I later asked to be in my wedding, Larry says, hey, did you guys see there were penguins downstairs in the courtyard? We should go get one. <laughs> now, I did one of two things that my, most of my teammates didn't do. I went to class and studied. So I just let this idea permeate throughout the group. Until two guys bolt out the door. They run through the hallway, they're in the elevator, down to the lobby floor, past the baccarat tables, running through the blackjack. You hear the dinging bells of the slots, and they're out there. And from our 13th floor window, we stood watching two little boys <laughs> looking at a penguin exhibit, staring at destiny. <laughs> and one of them jumped in to the water, swam up onto the penguin's exhibit, and ran around, and we split. <laughs> I ducked under the next room. I hid under the bed. I thought I looked terrible in orange. But man, I'm not getting arrested. This is Vegas. <laughs> and after 20 minutes, I thought, that's the luck of the Irish there. I didn't get caught, so I return to the scene of the crime. And I see two guys standing, soaking wet, covered in penguin crap. <laughs> My fingers bitten, and I think, oh. we need tools. So I rush into the hotel room and I say, we got a backpack. And I give it to someone, because I'm not going. <laughs> and they throw the backpack on and they dart downstairs and they get back past the blackjack tables. They see the roulette wheels spinning, they're running past the lights, and they're out there, these two strong men. They jump in and I think, yep, they're definitely getting arrested. Yes. <laughs> no way. They fish around, they grab a broom, and they start sweeping a bird into a bag. <laughs> <laughs> it may be one of the most awkward things you see, but they're getting arrested. <laughs> They come into the room, they kick open the door, they open the backpack, and they place a penguin oh. into our bathtub. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Squiggles. <laughs> Mr. Squiggles pooped all over our bathtub. <laughs> when we turn the cold water on, don't worry, we knew we were in college. <laughs> so we party. Our wrestling coach walks in and he says, Hey, what do you got in here, a hooker? And I thought very calmly, Honestly, that would be the most legal thing happening. <laughs> and the party was over. We grabbed Mr. Squiggles, put him into the backpack, and burst out into the hallway. And I tell you, there's an odd feeling. Holding a beer underage in a Vegas hallway, thinking, yeah, we're getting arrested. <laughs> Luck of the Irish habit hasn't happened yet. We walk into the elevator, hit the lobby button, we go down one floor. And a, lot, and a couple comes on and they say, how are you guys doing? And I'm trying to make conversation, minus the fact that Mr. Squiggles is doing what he does, looking like an Amber Alert. <laughs> 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 
fast we get out of the elevator, run past the blackjacks. I'm ringing ding, 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 ding. I take the backpack off and dump Mr. Squiggles into the top or into his exhibit, and I bolt. I am running. I hear freshmen yell, "No, that's my backpack!" <laughs> As I think, "Wow, we left all of the evidence in the exhibit." <laughs> I made it down the strip. I'm thinking, "I'm the luckiest Irishman in the world." I kick open the tattoo parlor's door and I say, "I'm." A Fighting Irishman, I want to get a tattoo. Oh. <laughs> that guy was really creative.
I am not playing with the full deck. <laughs> <laughs> I am a half centurion, but not at 52 yet. I am not playing with the full deck. And it is October, and this is the time of scariness. It's <laughs> <laughs> the time of like lots of things that just don't look so good. And, and to me, what's scary is maybe Halloween, maybe raining sideways, maybe sleep, maybe snow. But to a tree who's growing so happy, what's really scary is the person who's the keeper of the tree, who wants the orchard to do well. And to make the orchard well, we have to make sure that we top the tree. And this really can hurt the tree. But it's, it's good. It's actually it's good for the apples because if they're growing up, they're not making fruit. So you're supposed to cut them. You're supposed to cut them down so much that you can throw a cat through <laughs> And then the bunnies are getting them. The best thing to do with grounders, which you know, they're fun. Yeah. The things to do with grounders is to cut them up and cook them. That way you can make applesauce out of them. Or do the little cutter slicer finger and throw them in the freezer for pie later. So not playing with a full deck as I am. <laughs> it's, it's really hard when I go to work and I have to find some way, I'm in a I have to find some way to buckle down and do code. And I go into my room, and it's kind of, it's like, you got to be quiet, because other people are working, and you're supposed to concentrate. And I, I don't really have the opportunity to interact, so I guess Toastmasters is kind of my outlet to do that. It's not that <laughs> I'm having solitary cubicle confinement. <laughs> and, you know, here we are. We're in the nation's capital. And I swear, you know, sometimes I want to throw some of these guys in the solitary cubicle confinement to go figure it out. The other thing I found out about fall break. And our daughter's going to school out in New Jersey. The thing I found out about fall break is that traditionally they would go down to D.C. and campaign. So it's kind of like a good thing to do, to go down and campaign in November would be a good thing to do. Although I think I'd still like to have her come home and help us. You know, what's really scary? Lions. <laughs> <laughs> strange now. Uh, but to see what happens when they play football, it's kind of like a joke. We went there, we saw them play, it was a cat fight. It was the, it was the tigers against the leopards, and the tigers were losing, and we were there for family weekend, and my husband, he needed to get something to get away from all the craziness that's going on. Really, a lot of people, that's what they like about sports. Sports gets them away from the craziness. For myself, I dragged some of my coworkers out, and what we did was we played cards because it's a chance to, to tangibly work out your algorithms and socialize when you might have nothing to talk about. <laughs> and really, what makes a humor speech contest good is that people came and they spoke and they were funny, and we all got to listen. And we should be thanking for, for that. And I am thankful to the rest of you speakers for coming out. I am thankful. Thank you full for the evaluators who gave great team tips that I will probably you know, use shamelessly. And just thank you all for allowing me to breathe your air. <laughs>
Judges, mark your vows, please. Judges, please remember to sign your ballots in NATO. constantly, 
I read probably a book or two a week on different presenting techniques. I practice on YouTube. I listen to Prez's evaluation. I listen to Tim Wilson's evaluation. And I could probably take another two minutes, but knowing I have 30 seconds, we'll just end it with practice, practice, practice. And in that five minutes of spare time I have during a day, I do a little visualization. Did anybody take notes? Good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm from DePaul Leaders Toastmasters, uh, number 669822, and I've been at DePaul for about two years roughly, and my first club was actually in Lincoln Park. Okay. Uh, Lincoln, I think it's called Lincoln Toast or something like that. So. Oh. But that was my first club, and then uh, just the time didn't work out, and I was, I was a student at DePaul <coughs> at, at the time, so I figured I'll just be at DePaul and then go back, but uh, I became president of DePaul Leaders last year, and I've been at DePaul ever since. So. That's wonderful. Now, you're self-employed and an entrepreneur. Tell us a, bit, a little bit about that. Well, how much time do you have? <laughs> you have 29 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, my, a friend that I met through DePaul on a, a, a leadership retreat, he's big into IT, has the, made the DePaul app for the iPhone, um, had his own like tech team, and I'm more in the sales and the like PR type of, type of vibe, and so what we're going to do is we're going to combine that and do like a tech motivational type of company. There's a lot that goes into it, but in general, it's technology meets motivational speaking and training and keeping yourself accountable with certain principles. Well, I'm glad you have time to compete in that contest. Thank you so much. Okay. Kathy, 
have. <laughs> what do you anticipate? What you'll encounter when she's a teenager? I hope that she'll be a leader because she's showing leadership qualities now, and I hope she stays out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you took grace, probably, as you mentioned before, a pretty hot topic. What made you take that chance to build some humor? That's why, because it was a challenge. It's an issue that I think is, divides us in Chicago, and I think we should be divided and we celebrate it. I like that answer. So thank you for the unity.
CW Riverside Toastmasters, and we started in February. Well, Dan, you've been dressed in front of the audience. <laughs> Watching the timers, and then we're getting a little nervous. Here. <laughs> You've talked about stripping, <laughs> booted out of Bellagio. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your character. <laughs> I owe most of my tabletop topics to a drinking problem in college <laughs> and, and my ability to fight off an Irish family. So. <laughs> in, in all reality, it was an uh, impromptu evening in, in the way that happened, and uh, it's a story that we probably told a couple of times, no penguins were hurt. <laughs> we verified that, we verified that. Um, but yeah, it was uh, one of those stories that never gets old. So. Well, thank you for dressing back. <laughs>
Elton Jones. Second place winner tonight is Donna Marino. Woo!